i'm uh, i think i'm audible now so once again a very hearty welcome to you ma'am thank you so much for uh, joining in my name is hema i'm from the fifth batch of uh, students pursuing the post graduate diploma in facilitating governance reform offered by barefoot academy of governance and tis mumbai uh, it gives me immense pleasure to renew the samva dialogue start series which we had started over a year ago and uh, to have you as a special speaker uh, this evening i very a lot of heartfelt thanks to you ma'am for uh, being a part with us and uh, just to give a brief uh, this series is an initiative started by the students and the alum of the barefoot academy of governance it began more than a year ago and we've had interactions with speakers like harshmandar dr abhay shukla uh, aruna roy bejwada wilson on various issues and we've also had a uh, uh, documentation of our own journeys our coastmates journeys when they were in interaction with the migrant laborers during the lockdown crisis with the public health systems uh, across india so uh, this was more uh, the intent of this space was to be a space of dialogue and more importantly uh, going back after the dialogue on self reflection i think that is what we have been trying to achieve over the last few samvad series um and the one common thread of all the samvad series has been uh, the interplay of governance across various sectors be it education be it health and now uh, we have you uh, so for the rest right now we have uh, not only our batchmates we have our alum we also have others uh, whom we have invited who are very excited to hear you uh, just a brief about ma'am um, she is not only a noted academician a prolific writer and internationally acclaimed political theorist i remember ma'am mentioning during one of her talks that before uh, stepping into political science she wanted to be uh, she wanted to study english literature so i think it is not a surprise to uh, most of us here that she is a recipient of the ananda kentish kumar swami prize for the best book in south on south asia in the year 2015 currently ma'am is a centennial professor at the london school of economics she also holds the joint avanta chair at the king's india institute her latest book citizenship imperiled i am yet to read this book but i am really looking forward to it it examines how the constitutional guarantee for equal citizenship has been imperiled right now so today's talk which also has a lot of focus on social citizenship it's not only relevant to all of that all of those who are present here uh, but more importantly for us the students of governance who uh, we have been exposed to ma'am's writings right from her first module beat her paper in uh, economic political weekly which was there on our first module on democratic uh, development uh, it had broadened our horizon on what good governance the historical context of good governance is and since then we have been exposed to a lot of readings uh, throughout our entire one year our current batch the sixth batch which is going on now are still reading a lot of her books so we are greatly indebted to you ma'am for all your writings for all your books and mostly for coming and uh, consenting to speak to us uh, before we begin our uh, talk with you ma'am i would just take a little more time i would like to invite sham from our uh, present ongoing sixth batch of the pgd fgr uh, to introduce a little bit about the course and also introduce to everyone in the extended in the larger audience what we mean when we say kudam when we come to a kudam and about the samvad series over to you sham thank you thank you very much hema for that introduction i hope that i am visible uh, hema could you confirm that i am visible and audible yes yes wonderful thank you so much all right um thank you for that introduction uh nirja ma'am we are really happy to have you here um over to a short introduction about what what we are about here at the barefoot academy of governance um in a country like india with a co colonial history with a colonial history government and governance systems were tools to aid the colonial state to control local populations and assert their powers all government systems and processes were tuned to therefore maximize extraction and exploitation what was described by sardar patel as the steel frame of india became therefore a tool to ensure that people remained divided and submissive hierarchies were certainly not novel in india racked by and already familiar with class caste and religious hierarchies that determine both social and political power relationships what the colonizers did was to harden the mental construct of the rulers and the ruled 
and internalized notions of difference in governance. It is in this context, not just historical, but very much pervasive and present that the Barefoot Academy introduces to you, all of you participants, the idea of the kudam. The literal Tamil meaning of kudam is a gathering place. This is the space rendered and nurtured by this unique collaboration between Barefoot Academy and TISS to study governance. So participants in this kudam, whether students, faculty, or guests are treated as equals with an equal voice and opinion and the same privileges as everyone else. Even as we recognize that people are divided on class, on caste, gender, and several other criteria in social contexts, we endeavor to root ourselves in the ethical values of respecting divergent and different views. And we value self-regulation and self-implementation of these collective decisions. What we do is we recognize and normalize conflicts of opinion without viewing conflict as dysfunctional. Rather, we look at how we can reconcile differences. There are equivalences of Kudam in India that you may be familiar with, uh, such as the fundamental ideas behind the Chaupal or even the Panchayat. Um, taking these principles to heart, our course is uniquely structured in that it places as much importance on an intense inquiry into understanding the self as it does on theoretical concepts. Aided by dialogue, our faculty endeavors to take us on a journey of deep change where knowledge, skills, values, ethics, and attitude are integrated with action. Therefore, even as we recognize the significant power that each citizen in this session is imbued with as citizens with a capital C, today we warmly welcome all of you also as members of our Kudam. On that note, we venture into this journey of understanding citizenship and democratic governance with our speaker. Uh, we've had today a powerful reminder and demonstration of the power of participative citizenship. Uh, as nearly a few hours ago, one of the world's largest examples of mass mobilization potentially bore fruit with, with the announced rollback of farm laws. It is therefore a historic day for us to grapple with citizenship and governance with one of India's foremost academicians. Professor Nirja Jayal, over to you now. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Hema. Thank you, Shyam, for those uh, uh, wonderful introductions and introductory comments. And it truly is a historic day uh, to be talking about this subject. Um, I'm going to be, um, uh, I'm, I, I think my talk is going to be a little bit on the academic side uh, because my discussions with Hema have indicated that that would be welcome. Um, so, uh, so it's going to be less polemical, uh, but I think any, everything I say will have implications, um, uh, you know, uh, for contemporary uh, ways of being. Uh, I'm, I'm going to start by asking the question as to what does citizenship have to do with governance and especially with governance in a democracy. Um, typically, we think about citizenship in terms of the relationship between the citizen and the state. Um, so, of course, it is to do with governance. And we think about it in terms of three aspects of this relationship, which we consider to be significant. There are others, but these are the three most significant categories. Citizenship as legal status, which is basically you know, who is a citizen, who can be a citizen, what is the legal basis on which citizenship can be granted, etc. Uh, can immigrants become citizens? What rights do non-citizens have? All those kinds of questions. Then we think about citizenship as rights. Most often we in fact think about citizenship in terms of rights. So what does citizenship do? What rights do citizens have under the laws of the state, the constitution of a state and so on? Is it just civil and political rights like the right to vote or the right to free speech? Or do we also think about social and economic rights? Um, and these rights, the rights of the governed, are going to be my focus today, but in a bit. The third dimension of citizenship that we typically um, think about is citizenship as identity. Uh, this is important because it reminds us that even as we
more for special protection for particular groups of citizens who may be subject to forms of discrimination on a belonging to a minority uh, a minority group culture this group linguistic group or whatever those peoples guarantee equality which are difference blind which don't see difference but uh, you know say that notionally everyone is equal and nobody is specially deserving on account of disadvantage such policies can become clandestine vehicles of dominant cultures they can reinforce dominant cultures entrench dominant cultures even as they pretend to being uh, you know pretend to liberal neutrality perfect equality and so on so we may need differentiated citizenship rights whether it's affirmative action quotas minority rights language rights and, and so forth as as we all know now that's as far as context setting i'm going to be um, you know my talk will be in two parts the first part will discuss the conceptual questions involved in thinking about citizenship and governance and i think i will take you a little beyond perhaps uh, the, the classroom discussions that you've had on this uh, hema has very kindly uh, you know briefed me on that the second part will focus on the question of social citizenship and its importance for thinking about governance from the perspective of the governed which a lot of governance literature does not do it does not look at governance from the perspective of the governed but uh, from the other side so i understand that you're all aware uh, at least this batch of students are all aware of the history and the evolution of the discourse of good governance um you, some of you may also be aware that quite some years ago now in february 2004 two civil former civil servants madhav godbole and es sharma filed a pil asking the supreme court to pass an order uh, directing that good governance along with permanent politically neutral civil service etc should be declared an intrinsic part of the constitution they wanted it to be a part of the basic structure of the constitution good governance now um uh, they also said that civil servants must swear to abide by the principles of good governance and you know it was dismissed by the the pil was dismissed by the court it's not hard to see why because it is a uh, uh, good governance is a rather slippery and vague concept and and you know whose idea of good governance would people be swearing uh, to abide by now the concept of good governance may be slippery and vague apart from being other things which i will come to in a moment but the concept of governance is less so um good governance belongs more to the realm of policy discourse especially policies of development and aid and so on the um the idea of governance belongs more to the realm of academic discourse growing out of a feeling widely acknowledged that state driven or government driven governance had somehow changed and this happened about 20 odd years ago that a concept was needed to reflect that change and what was that change actually 30 years ago neoliberal economic policies the the principles of new public management uh, to re basically to replace large welfare state bureaucracies i'm talking now of the global north resurgence of civil society in eastern europe basically all the things that came along with globalization so the impetus for the shift from talking about government to talking about governance at least in the academic um, um a discourse was the need to understand how collective decision making takes place in this changed environment in a world that had changed by the turn of the century as a result of all these things that i mentioned globalization including neoliberalism challenges to the nation state challenges to state centric modes of governing it had become clear that while states still make collective decisions they do so under changed conditions they do so in conversation with other actors uh, and i know that you know many of you have read articles on the good governance discourse and this showed these many of these articles showed that the preoccupation with good governance was simplistic naive and some someone even called it a technicist illusion because the whole drift the whole focus of these right uh, of this discourse was an administrative fix a kind of managerial fix as if the administrative capacity of the state could be enhanced by simply detaching it from the world of politics forgetting about what the essential nature of the state is right and 
at this time, there was also a, a difference of focus, something I alluded to earlier, between the policy-oriented, mostly donor-driven discourse and academic writings on the subject. So the donor-driven discourse was motivated by and geared towards improving policy effectiveness. It was about how to make states and their policy structures in developing countries conform to Western norms. Basically, how to create the kinds of state market mechanisms that existed in the liberal capitalist systems. But academic writers, on the other hand, were more interested in understanding the institutional linkages between state and society in different contexts. So um, scholars like Merrily Grindle, I don't know if you've heard of her, her work, uh, wrote a series of papers. In fact, Grindle wrote a, a, a series of papers on this subject between 2007 and 2017. So over a period of 10 years. And the titles alone, and I can share these with you later, uh, the titles alone are a very good indication of the journey of the concept. So, you know, from good governance, there was an article on good, good enough governance, then she wrote another one called Good Enough Governance Revisited. And then she wrote one called Good Governance, The Inflation of an Idea. I'm going to talk about it briefly. And then finally, she wrote one called Governance RIP. Rest in peace, right? So basically what, uh, what, was, uh, you know, what she was attempting to show was that governance interventions are not introduced in a vacuum. They are built on some foundation of existing state capacity, low or you know, somewhat low or whatever it might be. So what we need to understand is states. We need to understand how they differ from each other in terms of institutions, in terms of how they're organized, in terms of legitimacy and so on. So good governance is important. It's a nice idea, but it is not a magic bullet. And there's no basis for saying, as she showed, that just having this idea of good governance floating around is going to result in growth or development or democracy or even poverty reduction. Hmm? In fact, in trying to generate good governance through aid, developing countries became laboratories for donor action. And one study showed, which, which used data from 1999 to 2001, uh, and looked at a list of 53 donors, both bilateral and multilateral that they had provided assistance to an average of, hold your breath, 107 countries each, okay? Recipient countries were dealing with an average of 26 donors each. 40 countries were dealing with 30 or more donors. This became a huge burden on developing country governments because they were dealing with this multitude of donors, this ever expanding agenda, everything that could possibly be encompassed by the idea of development was being uh, you know, push down, shove down their throats. And eventually this is why Grindle called good governance an impossibly inflated idea. It was such a huge catalog of nice things of virtuous characteristics that the line between good governance and development actually got blurred. The belief that development requires good governance or is it good governance that leads to development? Which is cause, which is effect? The two concepts basically became inseparable from each other they were kind of bleeding into each other, right? So Grindle's general off, off take from all of this, uh, or these considerations was that, that recent scholarship has come to agree upon some central propositions um, in relation to the dynamics of governance reform. And a couple of points, basically, that governance conventions differ across countries. There is no one right configuration that will lead to competence and effectiveness in the public sector. You can have more effective governance being achieved through a variety of institutional designs, through a variety of processes, a variety of policies, and what works in one place will not work in another. There is no universal recipe. There are no technical fixes, okay? The pathways to improved governance are likely to be numerous. They're definitely contingent, and they're definitely subject to history. So you can think about all the new laws, all the new systems or changes in formal rules, but they are not going to go translate into change in practice uh, because formulating interventions is, not, is, is, is only part of the story. Implementing change is important and implementation has to take into account that countries differ in their histories and the institutions they have, the conditions that prevail, and how workable these interventions will be. So reforms can take years, reforms can even take decades. 
to produce improved performance. Sometimes there might be political opposition, which will cause them to be reversed. And, and there are sometimes also uh, you know, what economists have called political settlements, which is how an elite is able to use its power to either establish or to distort institutions to serve its own interests. It may not be in the interests of elites to improve how government works. And we need to keep that in mind. So we need to understand political economy. We need to understand whether reformers should make incremental adjustments or whether you know, the institutions of power have to be recreated altogether or significantly modified, whatever. Now, uh, this was a rather long overview of the, of, of the literature on um, good governance, but I basically want to emphasize one thing that, that that's one aspect that is rarely flagged in these debates uh, is the fact that the governance discourse typically excludes those who are governed. Governance is for them rather than by them, by them only in the minimal sense of prescriptions, free elections, multi-party systems, and then we are done. You know, that's, that's the way in which the governance discourse has looked at democracy um, in, in, in past uh, years. So the question that arises is, how uh, does this transformation that we've been talking about in governance practices affect practices of citizenship? And um, it is my view that too little attention has been given to the question of whether the citizen state relationship undergoes a change when we speak of governance rather than when we speak of government. Do the elements of the new governance encourage citizenship or undermine it? So the real question is governance on whose behalf, right? Now, the good governance perspective had what we might call a normative view of governance, what it ought to be like, what it should be like. And I'm going to ask you to attend briefly to the more descriptive view of governance, which recognizes that whether we like it or not, whether we like it or not, this is not a question of what ought to be or what should be, but whether we like it or not, power is, and this again, as I said, dates back to uh, 20 odd years ago, power is no longer concentrated in the state, but it is dispersed laterally as well as vertically. That was the basic starting point of academic discussions on governance, uh, uh, you know, uh, like I said, from the late 90s onwards. The lateral dispersal of power is signified by recognizing at least three broad domains of governance, the state, the market, and civil society. Civil society encompassing both social movements and the non-governmental sector. The vertical dispersal of power is signified by the displacement of the national level of governance and the proliferation in levels of governance from the local to the national, to the regional or subnational, to the national, to the, uh, and you know, sometimes the supranational, but, and then all the way to the global. In each of these domains and in each of these levels, there are important concerns about democracy and indeed about citizenship. So I'm going to very briefly flag what these are. What are the consequences of these multiple displacements of power on the practice of democratic citizenship? So, you know, there are, I mean, there are ways of disaggregating and studying the impact of these new structures, these new processes for the way in which citizenship has been conceptualized. The central question is this, if power is more dispersed than it used to be, does that make it more accountable or less accountable? With power being redistributed, what are the consequences for citizenship, right? If power is actually dispersed between state, market, and civil society, for instance, there's a pluralization of power. If state is no longer the locus or the exclusive locus of citizenship and citizenship identity, then what is, right? So how do citizens relate to these different domains? How do they relate, relate to different levels of governance, global, local, and so on? Also, what is the, uh, how differentiate, how do we think about the differentiated impact of these institutions on different categories of citizens, uh, the poor, the marginalized women, and so on. So let me say just a few words about the citizenship and the horizontal dispersal of power, and I'll leave the rest to your imaginations. In the governance discourse, the citizen is essentially reinvented as a consumer of market-produced goods 
or as a user of the civic services provided by public institutions. The relationship remains hierarchical. Worse, the citizen no longer holds rights and entitlements in relation to these services. To the extent that following principles of what was called the new, is still called the new public management, capital N, capital P, capital M. To the extent that new public management has prevailed, public services and welfare functions are franchised out to private firms and sometimes to non-governmental organizations. They are thus placed beyond the reach of the citizen. The citizen is reinvented as a consumer of these services or as a user of these services, but not as someone who holds a right or a legitimate claim to those services, right? What about the market? A great amount of talk of corporate governance, uh, or at least they used to be till some years ago, which generally translates as shareholders' interests, intended to reassert the control of shareholders vis-a-vis -vis that of management. But while shareholders count, organized labor still does not. Now, one form of citizenship in the market is often spoken of, especially in the Western context, as consumer citizenship, where people say they make consumer choices on the basic of, basis of ethical considerations or social or ecological considerations. So they will only have a fair trade uh, coffee or uh, you know, responsibly sourced uh, ingredients and, and food and so on. But in our context, can poor consumers who depend on things like the PDS for food security even complain about the quality of food grain they get? let alone exercise consumer citizenship in the form of ecologically responsible choices and such like, right? I mean, we're talking about two completely different worlds here. Should we then turn to civil society, state market civil society, should we turn to civil society to restore the accountability and the responsiveness that we find missing in the state and the market? This is an extremely difficult question to answer given how amorphous the category of civil society is, how diverse um, the actors that populate it are. For instance, um, social movements are likely to be more representative of popular aspirations than non-governmental organizations engaged in development work, some of which partner the government in service delivery. So the more radical possibilities of civil society are exemplified by social movements, the environmental movement, the feminist movement, and today is the day to mention the farmers movement, which have emancipatory political programs. The relationship between these and the state is mostly conflictual, mutually hostile, unlike NGOs, which as public service contractors may be involved in providing efficient mechanisms of public service delivery in ways that social movements simply won't. So those engaged in service deli delivery may appear to be unrepresentative, unaccountable, because they often have a collaborative relationship with the state. On the other hand, those engaged in protest and resistance, those who seek to transform society, may be ineffective in making a long-term and sustainable contribution to policy because they have a more adversarial relationship to the state. Um, but to the extent that civil society is content with its role as a third sector nonprofit, it can sometimes fail in its function of political vigilance, and thereby it might legitimize the state. If it fails to question social and economic inequalities, for instance, it legitimizes also the functioning of the market where many of these inequalities are generated. This week, of course, we have learned that civil society is the fourth frontier of war, the sphere of fourth generation warfare. But only this morning, we heard of a major triumph of civil society, a year long movement that succeeded uh, uh, against all odds. Now, one area where civil society and market may be encountered at, at the point of their intersection is arguably the media. For those of you familiar with the work of Jean Drez and Amartya Sen, uh, Hunger and Public Action in particular, you would remember that they argued that the importance of a free press and adversarial politics for keeping hunger at bay, for public action that kept hunger at bay. That was the argument. Clearly, a free and responsible media is important for the effective performance of citizen roles because it makes possible a variety of things. It makes possible, first of all, the transmission of information. 
um, the um, airing of a variety of opinions, the exercise of freedom of thought and speech, and so on. Now, state-controlled media have their limitations in this respect, but it's worth asking to what extent a corporatized media can fulfill these objectives. And then, of course, there's the new phenomenon of social media, which offers a very hospitable environment for the manufacture of fake news, of biased and prejudiced opinions, and even hate. Is the medium, is, is, is the media ecosystem actually capable of facilitating the exercise of citizenship? And these are these are open questions, obviously. Now I won't go into the question of this of citizenship and the vertical dispersal of power. What I was trying to show was that if you look at the pluralization of power across state, market, and civil society, you find that citizens' rights, uh, uh, you know, the language of rights is in a sense. Uh, diminished or eroded, whereas and, and the possibilities of citizens uh, securing accountability in these three domains is minimized. Uh, it's very similar with the vertical dispersal of power. I mean, global governance. Um, you know, there is global civil society. There is transnational activism. At you know, when WTO meetings take place or COP twenty six and so on. But by and large, we know that multilateral economic institutions are dominated by the North and that even in institutions like the IMF, voting power is proportional to share of capital and so on, but capital and, and decision-making, uh, the, the decisions that are made in these forums have very far reaching impact over large numbers of people who have no way of, of influencing those decisions, right? Um, supranational governments like the EU, uh, as we know, these institutions often do not uh, fulfill the political wills of citizens, local governance, you know better than I, uh, how, uh, you know, how well things like Gram Sabha's function or don't function, but also the limited nature of decisions because of the, uh, the, uh, the limitations on the powers that are devolved. So basically the point here is that across these levels and across these domains, the fundamental relationship of governing remains that between citizens and states. Despite the pluralization of power, state power remains central to governing. Even where displacements of power have occurred, they have occurred with the consent of states as a consequence of policy choices exercised by states. So states are far from obsolete. States are not threatened with extinction. The states continue to be very central. Uh, states are continue to be central in multiple ways. I mean, if the, if the state decides to do governance through policy networks, it is the state which decides which groups will be consulted. And they would tend to be groups with broadly compatible visions and perspectives, right? Rather than groups which have a fundamental disagreement uh, with, with the, with the uh, group that, or, or with the um, government that um, uh, sort of happens to occupy decision-making positions. States also may seem to be spending less on public services, but the shrinkage in some areas is more than compensated by the shrinkage by, by the expansion in other areas. So you may have less welfare spending, but you may have more spending by states on security, on surveillance, uh, on those sorts of technologies, sometimes even on environmental protection and consumer protection and so on, certainly in the global north. And finally, for most people, the nation state remains the most important locus of identity, right? I mean, Brexit is a clear uh, instance of some, uh, you know, of, of uh, a clear example of the fact that even supranational regional bodies like the EU have not managed to attract the loyalty of citizens in quite the same way as nation states do. So, so long as the world is organized around territorially constituted populations, electing national governments, nation states cannot but remain. Uh, as, uh, as the social theorist Michael Mann put it uh, a long time ago, citizens have remained, he said, and I quote him here, true zoo animals dependent on emotionally attached to their national cages. Right? That sort of, uh, I think, sums it up. So let me uh, transit now to the second and uh, I think more substantial part of what I uh, want to say today, which is on social citizenship. Now, I don't know whether the concept of social citizenship is familiar, so let me start by explaining briefly what it is and where the idea comes from and why it is relevant. Uh, we all know that civil and political rights are historically associated with citizenship 
in democracies, right? The assumption being that these equal rights of citizenship will mitigate inequality, if only because citizens will, through the democratic process, use their political rights to bring about greater equality through voting in governments, which will make policies, which will mitigate inequality, right? That's the general way in which we think about this. But history shows that equal citizenship in this sense, in this form of the civil and political equality of all citizens does not eliminate inequality. So what is it really worth? What, that is to say, what can citizenship actually mean in the presence of deep social inequalities. Citizenship is in a certain sense, uh, appears as something contradictory because it's playing two fundamentally opposing roles. On the one hand, citizenship is committed to undermining inequality, right? On the other, it works to present inequality as legitimate. So if someone says there's inequality, you say, well, of course there's citizenship, everyone has equal rights, yeah? And this is the central contradiction that lies at the heart of the theory of citizenship and its practice. Social citizenship is generally seen as a way of mediating this contradiction. And the form it takes is the public provision of welfare whether this is done through social and economic rights or through progressive, possibly redistributive policies associated with welfare states, these are seen as plausible ways of bridging this gap. Now, the normative justification for social citizenship is that substantive equality, not just formal equality, but substantive equality is needed for effective citizenship. Citizens would be more, would have greater agency, would be more effective citizens if they were in fact substantively equal. If they are worrying about the next meal or worrying about where they're going to sleep, they're hardly likely to be uh, effective uh, agents of citizenship. The idea is that a concept of citizenship which includes a guarantee of social provision is more attractive as an ideal than one which does not. Now, for Marx, citizenship did not, could not mitigate the inequalities of social class in capitalist society because these inequalities were structural. A slightly different answer was offered by the British sociologist T.H. Marshall in lectures delivered in 1949, published in a book called Citizenship and Social Class the following year, 1950, in which Marshall pointed to the dis this discrepancy between the political equality of an individual in capitalist democracy on the one hand, and on the other, the manifest inequality of that individual's position in the class structure. Marshall said that this made a person's identity as a citizen legal and mythical. Um, this was already said 100 years before Marshall, in a certain sense, alluded to by the famous uh, French writer, journalist, and poet, Anatole France, who had said, uh, and I'm quoting him here, the law in its majestic equality forbids the rich as well as the poor. The law in its majestic equality forbids the rich as well as the poor to sleep under bridges, to beg in the streets, and to steal bread, unquote. Now we know that the rich are unlikely to sleep under the bridges or beg in the streets or steal bread. It's only the compulsions of the poor that are likely to leave them with little option but to do these things. So a century later, Marshall powerfully addressed this question of whether basic equality embodied in the rights of citizenship is consistent with the inequalities of social class. It was assumed in British society in the mid 20th century that the two were compatible, that civil and political equality was compatible with the inequalities of social class, which was why Marshall said that citizenship has itself become in certain respects, and I'm quoting him here, the architect of legitimate social inequality. Citizenship as the architect of legitimate social inequality. He famously distinguished between three elements of citizenship, 
the civil element, the rights that are necessary for individual freedom, the political element, the right to participate in the exercise of political power, and the social element. This is the important one, which he defined as, and I'm quoting again, the whole range from the right to a modicum of economic welfare and security, to the right to share to the full in the social heritage and to live the life of a civilized being according to the standards prevailing in the society." Unquote. Full inclusion, in other words, civic, political, social, economic, cultural, full inclusion is the condition of full citizenship. That's effectively what he's saying. And Marshall's discussion of these included the rights to unemployment insurance, old age pension, public education, healthcare, and legal aid as well. So these social rights or rights of social citizenship were also being provided for by the welfare state in Britain, which came into place at about this time. Let's now turn to India. At one level, it's quite extraordinary that the understanding of citizenship amongst our nationalist elites encompassed social and economic rights from a very early time, literally from the 1920s. If you uh, have read about the Karachi resolution of the uh, International Congress in 1931, it pledged its commitment to a range of economic rights. And yet a hundred years later, we really can't say we have made progress commensurate with even that vision. Despite these promising beginnings of nationalist thinking, despite the fact that there was a sympathetic international environment in engaging with issues of human rights in the widest sense, at the time that India got independence, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights had come up in 1948. And then after that, there were the two international covenants that were being drafted in which we were involved. The history of social and economic rights in India is one of, one might say, ideological ambivalence and political compromises. Yes, a powerful case was made in the Constituent Assembly to include various social rights in the fundamental rights chapter of the Constitution but eventually they were placed in a non-justiciable section of the constitution, as we know, the directive principles. And two arguments were used to achieve this. The first argument was that a constitutional document should properly not be spelling out social policies because social policies are ideological in nature. These are social policies. A constitution should spell out the framework, but not the social policies because these policies should be decided upon by elected legislatures. Why? Because such policies entail public decisions about how social resources are to be distributed. Certainly will entail um, public decisions about things like taxation and redistribution, right? Um, so these should be decided upon by elected legislatures rather than by, uh, uh, the constitution should not spell these out. So a dist distinction was introduced between rights and policies. Um, and it was claimed that a constitution could guarantee rights, but a constitution is not an appropriate instrument of policy, right? The second argument uh, rested on what is now widely acknowledged, widely recognized to be a fallacious distinction between rights that have costs and rights that don't have costs. So, for the longest time, people, and not just in India, but in many other places, too, believed that civil and political rights are negative rights. They simply require the state to abstain from action, whereas social and economic rights demand positive state action. So those that demand positive state action are unaffordable in a poor country. Negative rights are fine. They are costless, while positive rights require resources. Today, we know that this is flawed. This is a flawed assumption because all rights have costs. And there's good work on this uh, by legal and political theorists to show that rights are costly because remedies are costly. Enforcement, especially if it is to be uniform enforcement, fair enforcement is expensive. And legal rights, if they are unenforced are hollow, they don't mean anything. All rights are basically claims to an affirmative response from government. Therefore, all rights have costs civil and political, economic and social, they have different types of costs, but they all have costs. Now, ultimately, as we know, the obligations of the state to citizens were transformed into these directive principles, which were basically principles to guide state action. 
but not available to citizens in the form of enforceable rights. So it was curious that it was in the context of the economic reforms of the early 2000s that we had a, an absolute explosion of rights at one time, a right to work in the form of Manrega. In 2005, the right to information the same year. In 2009, the right to education, which had, you know, in a sense already been recognized by the Supreme Court in Muni Krishnan uh, several years earlier, was given constitutional status. And in 2013, a national law on food security was enacted. The impetus, as you know well, for these enactments of social and economic rights came from a combination of judicial activism and civil society mobilization. But the central question about the content of these new social rights remain. Are they universal? Are they realizable? Are constitutional sanctions adequate guarantees of their realization? But I want to raise a conceptual question, the question of not the question of implementing social rights, which you know you will know better than I do. Um, the conceptual question is this: the Indian state has typically approached citizens through the construction of categories, categories of exception, we might call them, classifying different sections of the population for the delivery of particular goods, welfare goods included. The, the ostensible object uh, was to bridge the gap between formal citizenship and real or substantive citizenship. So the official strategy of special rights for special groups detaches the benefits of social provisioning from the status of citizenship, right? Civil and political rights are equal, everybody has them. Whether you realize them to lesser or greater degrees is a different question, but they are integrally linked to the status of citizenship, right? These kinds of welfare rights, because they are targeted, because they are targeted to particular groups, they are not integrally linked to citizenship. All citizens are entitled to civil and political rights. Those who possess additional entitlements to social and economic provisioning are also formal citizens in the sense of civil and political rights, but their enjoyment of welfare provisioning derives from, is conditional upon their placement in particular categories, particular boxes labeled in particular ways. The justification obviously is that greater substance will be given to their equal civic status through such provisioning. But in reality, because such provisioning is invariably of a much inferior quality, poorer services for poorer people, poor quality of education, poor quality of healthcare, this is targeted, this is not universal, right? The creation of such categories works as a strategy of what Marshall presently called class abatement. It is abating, uh, it, is, it is an attempt to abate the uh, uh, the distinctions of class, right? It's, it's ironical actually, doubly ironical that the time, the, the moment at which the Indian state acknowledged and signified its ability, its willingness to help the poor happened to coincide with the introduction of new public management systems. So the responsibility for delivering welfare services came to be distributed amongst a range of non-state agencies and NGOs and others. So citizens, in a sense, had more rights than they'd ever before enjoyed. But while they, their, their rights claims would be addressed to the state, because the state had withdrawn from the delivery of services and the provisioning of these services was being done by other agencies, who would be held accountable? You can address, this, you can address your rights claim to the state, but the state says, well, but you know, now it is this agency which is delivering this service. So do you hold the state accountable or do you hold that agency accountable? How do you do this? In relation to non-state agencies, the citizen was rendered a user of services, not a rights bearing citizen. And this subtle change in vocabulary signaled a move away from the language of citizenship and rights and entitlements. Also, while these social rights uh, had, had been, you know, had uh, been granted uh, and so on, uh, the celebration of these rights was by no means universal. There was resistance from the middle classes, recently empowered by economic reforms, who did not show the kind of civic solidarity that you need, that other countries have had in the 1930s and 1940s and 50s, 
which underwrites redistributive social policy. If you look at the history of welfare policy in Scandinavia or even in the UK, you will see that, that the, there, are, there is a cross-class coalition. There is a certain level of civic solidarity which underwrites the desire to do redistribution through social policy. Now, you will remember just a few years ago, election campaigns which had pitted aspirations against welfare, which had claimed that poor voters were fed up with handouts, that voters aspired to real opportunities for economic mobility, and, and, and had been promised empowerment rather than entitlement, which was basically a, a, a negatively, a word which, was, which had pejorative connotations. Now, it's another matter that Manrega has proved to be the main source of sustenance for the rural poor, uh, especially in the context of pandemic era job losses. But I, I should mention here that this privileging of this idea of empowerment over entitlement resonates with a form of welfare capitalism practiced in the East Asian countries. It's been called productivist welfare capitalism. And I, and I want to mention this for a specific reason because in various ways, this idea gets signaled in our polity from time to time. What it is, is an instrumental conception in which social policy, basic social provisioning are governed not by the idea of enhancing capabilities or human flourishing or even human development, none of those. They are governed by the objective of making the citizen workforce productive. So you will provide welfare services because it makes for a productive workforce, right? And this has been called productivist welfare capitalism in the East Asian context. But that, leave that aside for now. Um, today, what are we seeing? And again, you know, you will work at the grassroots, so you would know much more about this than I do. Uh, but uh, you know, mine is um, my my information is from reading studies and such like. Many social security schemes are designed to ensure that beneficiaries pay. sometimes a small amount, a token amount, a small token premium, instead of receiving what are being called free SOPs. Look at the JAM program, so-called, Jandhan Yojana Aadhaar Mobile. This was supposed to facilitate direct trans, uh, cash transfers, which would replace the in-kind entitlements. Uh, we know that Jandhan is meant for financial inclusion, enabling the opening of bank accounts for the poor, even if there is no balance in them. And then these accounts were linked to Aadhaar and to the mobile telephone number of the individual. Now, under the Jandhan Yojana, a large number of mostly zero bank balance, uh, zero balance bank accounts were in fact opened. Um, I understand the figure was between 2014 and 2016, 6 million. I don't know what the current figure is. And a journalistic investigation which used the right to information revealed that small sums ranging from one to five rupees had, unknown to the account holders, been deposited in many of these accounts in public sector banks. The money had been deposited by mid-level bank officials. The money was often diverted from the entertainment allowance of the bank branch, the maintenance allowance, the canteen allowance, this and that. And some officials admitted that they'd been under pressure to show that zero balance accounts were declining in number. One official even said that there was a perception that if you have so many zero balance accounts, it means that no one's using them and we were under pressure to change that. So the number of zero balance accounts declined from eight and a half million in, in August, 2014 to 5.8 million two years later. And the government's initiative of financial inclusion got a positive spin. Schemes for insurance and pensions are also based on contributions, uh, supposedly to automatically debit the Jandhan account. Often the jobless poor are not in a position to deposit money into their Jandhan accounts, but the rules say that the benefits of the insurance and pension plans will cease if there is insufficient money in the bank account to keep the plan going. So social security is, in other words, offered to those who earn sufficient wages to be able to make deposits for the really poor, working in the unorganized sector, it arguably remains eyewash. The philosophy of welfare underlying these initiatives represents a turning back on rights-based programs to those that are linked to earnings and contributions. This is what Bismarck did in the late 19th century, okay? 
Another claim on behalf of new modes for the delivery of welfare was that they'll resolve all problems of leakages. They will ensure effective delivery through direct benefit transfers, which are paid into the, the Jandhan accounts, and through the use of the biometric identity or Aadhaar. In the case of the in the case of food, it implied a shift from the ration cards of the PDS system, um, under which people obviously could get subsidized food at fair price shops. New system requires them to draw money paid by the government into their bank account and purchase food from the PDS. And studies of the pilots that I have seen, uh, they could be dated now, have shown that this has not been working too well. People are forced to spend more time traveling to banks, sometimes multiple times, to check on whether funds have been received, then go to the market to purchase food at a considerably higher price than the subsidized rations they previously got. And there is a punitive sanction. If a household does not purchase rice from the PDS, it is threatened with a discontinuation of the subsidy, of the direct benefit transfer subsidy. Niti Aayog did a study, um, uh, or, or commissioned a study, which was done in three union territories, Delhi, Pondicherry, and Dadra and Nagar Haveli, where the pilot was conducted. It found that on average, it costs, it costs beneficiaries more in terms of time and money to travel to banks, to access the cash, and then to markets to use the cash than it did to collect food rations. People also found the cash inadequate for accessing the same amount of food as they would have got through the PDS, the majority preferring the old system of ration shops to the new system of cash transfers. Similar, pilot in Jharkhand showed 97% of citizens opposed it, saying the money does not come into the bank account on time. It's often not clear which family member's Jandhan account will be credited with the subsidy. So people are running to different banks several times, sometimes for a week. Sorry, there's a... So people are running to different banks several times to find out whether the money has arrived and if so, in whose account. And the price is at that time 32 rupees per kg as opposed to one rupee per kg under the old system. Then of course, there was the scandal of the seeding of ration cards with Aadhaar. Those who could not seed their ration cards, uh, they were simply canceled. So on the one hand, the government claimed credit in parliament for having saved vast amounts of public uh, money by having weeded out fake cards. But on the other, the mass exclusion of the very poor led also to multiple starvation deaths that we've all read about. Those who could not meet the requirement of seeding came to be denied rations, therefore, in the public distribution system as well. So in other words, you could possess both Aadhaar and the ration card, but unless they had been linked, you could not get benefits. It's only when that young girl of 11, uh, uh, you know, died uh, that that in Jharkhand that they, it was acknowledged that this policy uh, was flawed and had excluded the most vulnerable. Subsequently, of course, the Supreme Court also ruled on Aadhaar that it will remain mandatory for social service delivery. This came as uh, you know this satisfied the middle classes who were resentful of this requirement of linking Aadhaar with their phone numbers and bank accounts, but it kept the poor as vulnerable as before. For the poor, seeding and authentication of Aadhaar for every new welfare scheme is required. And benefits will be discontinued if seeding is not done. In some such cases, such as um, for those registered under the Employment Guarantee Scheme, this entails double seeding, linking of both bank account and job card under the Aadhaar Payments Bridge system. This obsession with technology as the preeminent mode of service delivery has, even if it's in a small number of cases, has resulted in the denial of the right to life, whether due to hunger or the inability to access emergency health care. The extent of the rightlessness of the poor, as I wind down, um, of the poor to, uh, is underscored by the jettisoning of the rights-based approach in favor of an approach that expects people to make contributions. They may be modest contributions, but contributions to their own social security. Not only can vast numbers of unemployed people not afford such contributions. And, we, and we've seen you know, what the LPG subsidy uh, has, has done. But let me, let me return to the point. I, I just realized, uh, Hema, I'm sorry, I think I've taken more time perhaps than I ought to have. Is that the case? 
I, I didn't notice when I started and you had said 45, I don't know when I started, but anyway, then let me sort of wind down now. Let me return to the point I made earlier, that the enjoyment of welfare provisioning remains in line with what Marshall famously called class abatement. Effectively, what this means is that the enjoyment of welfare is conditional upon one's placement in official categories like below poverty line. If only special groups can enjoy special rights, then the benefits of social welfare are effectively delinked from the status of citizenship, which is universalist and equal. Those who are disadvantaged need these special markers of citizenship, if you may, if you like, I, I, if I may call them that, the signs of belonging to boxes which are you know, poor or Dalit and other such titles and other such labels. At the same time, however, the markers themselves stigmatize their citizenship. They make it of lesser consequence than the real citizenship of the unmarked citizen. So while the Aadhaar marker, technically universal in application, pretends to treat all citizens equally, it is a fact that the goods for which it is mandatory, whether it's food or cooking gas subsidies, are not those to which the otherwise unmarked citizen aspires. When welfare provisioning is universal, as it has been in various Western countries, um, to greater or lesser degree now, but in the past has been, all citizens have the same access to public systems of health and education. To the extent that welfare is not universal, like I said, it is detached from the equality of citizenship, the kind of equality that obtains when we speak about civil and political rights. Okay, so it stigmatizes the recipients of, uh, of, of such provisioning. Uh, it stigmatizes also the welfare services to which they are entitled. These being the limitations of social rights in our context, it's hardly surprising that the three social groups which manifest the worst human development indicators, the lowest human development indicators are Dalits, Adivasis, and Muslims, all who enjoy the formal status of citizenship, but for these groups, substantive citizenship, the ability to meaningfully exercise their rights is far from realized. Social citizenship is not the only aspect of citizenship that is important or endangered today. The legal basis of citizenship is also being rewritten, as we know, in forms that are very exclusionary, that are based on identity, in fact, religious identity. Given the marginalization, given the vulnerability of these groups, given the histories of prejudice in our society, it is likely that these groups, more than others, will be pulled backwards, especially through instruments like the NRC, which will affect the poor, which will affect Dalits, Adivasis, and of course, Muslims perhaps even deprived of the formal legal status of citizenship. So we stand in danger of moving from substantively second-class citizenship for certain groups to formal legal second-class citizenship. And this is something that should worry us, should, should disturb our conscience. I'm sorry I've taken so much time, but thank you for your patience. Thank you. Not at all, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for the wonderful talk. Uh, we also have some questions in the chat. Uh, but before that, I think these are the conversations that we've been having also in terms of the concept of othering, the uh, concept of invisibility when we uh, have these welfare schemes. And especially from the bureaucracy where uh, a lot of policies are made uh, thinking they're doing a favor rather than uh, the policies coming about saying that, yes, this, these are the rights. These are the things that we need. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. I think we'll uh, quickly move on to the question and answer session. I'm sure we have uh, a lot of them. You, do you want me to look at the chat box or do you want to uh, send questions in, in my direction? Yes, so we'll just, uh, we have one uh, from uh, Ranu Tomar. Uh, we'll, all, we'll just take right. the uh, right. questions. Okay. I'll read them out for you. I, I've, I've, I've seen Ranu Tomar, 1635, yeah. So, uh, and then we can also have from the participants, ma'am. So. Okay. Uh, should we take two, three questions at a time? or do so Should I look at these first? Maybe read these first and answer these first and then we can take the others? Sure. Is that okay? Yes, yes. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. All right. So Ranu Tomar is asking three questions, no, two questions. How to theorize difference between citizen and netizen in the context of media and democracy and social media? Um, does it raise question of agency? Well, of course, it raises the question of agency to the extent of access, who has access to social media and who does not. Uh, so that I, I think agency is in that sense uh, structured and filtered. 
but citizen and netizen, uh, I guess, you know, in, in conceptual terms, netizen um, would simply be a person who is participating in the world of the internet, right? Um, there's no special obligation to be citizen-like in that. There's no special affiliation. Uh, there's no, uh, uh, yeah, there's, uh, I mean, I, I think netizen can be, to be a netizen can be hugely empowering because it can help you participate in a virtual public sphere that you otherwise might not have access to, especially if you live in a small place where you don't have you know, like-minded people and so on to talk to. It can be an extremely empowering thing because it enables you to interact with, uh, with people um, um, uh, who either share your worldview or, who's, uh, or, or who can have the kinds of conversations you want to have. And you can also express yourself uh, when you don't have other forums to express yourself. Um, <clears throat> uh, however, I think social media also has other difficulties, and the difficulties are that it enables, uh, apart from enabling bots and so on, uh, which is the, the common problem that we are all, all aware of, fake accounts and bots, uh, social media also, sorry, and the questions are sort of moving up and down a bit, so yeah. Um, there is also a problem of irresponsibility, right? As a citizen, you uh, can be made to take responsibility uh, for what you think and do. Uh, as a netizen, it's harder to uh, enforce accountability, um, uh, you know, and, and, and for people to actually take responsibility uh, for their, I mean, if, if they, for instance, uh, put out, uh, let's say, hugely racist ideas and incite people to violent action, for instance, uh, it may be hard to book a netizen Whereas a citizen should ideally be booked uh, if they if they do something like that, if they issue that kind of provocation. So, uh, you know, yes, there is a difference. Um, there is an important difference. Now, Ranu Tomar also has another question, which says, since there is mention as constitution is not the right instrument for policy, should we not refer to constitution to understand citizenship in democracy? I don't understand what this means. I was only referring to the uh, I, I didn't say that I necessarily agree that constitutions are not the right instrument for policy because the South African constitution and the Brazilian constitution, uh, uh, you know, one in 1995, the other in 19, 1996, the other in 1985, uh, do in fact provide for social rights. So constitutions can provide social rights and I think it's a good idea to do that. The New Zealand constitution provides the right to academic freedom. Okay, I mean, constitutionalizes the right to academic freedom. So you have, yes, you do have constitutions which do provide uh, for social and economic rights. And, uh, and, you know, this is obviously something which is a more recent development in the world, uh, but it's a positive development. Of course, it doesn't mean that South Africa has not had its share of troubles in actually implementing and realizing those rights. There are two or three very famous cases uh, to do with food and to do with, uh, with health, particularly and housing three major areas in which there have been major, uh, there's, there's a huge body of very significant jurisprudence, but uh, it is not my case that constitution is not the right instrument for policy. It is uh, for social policy, it can be. It's just that that was the nature of the debate in the constituent assembly where the argument was made, which is why what some people wanted to be in the fundamental rights chapter, uh, to be placed in that chapter were actually placed in directive principles. Uh, Sham is asking about class class abatement to abate, not abet. It's class abatement. Okay. Right. Anisha Chaudhary says the key responsibilities of being a netizen almost absolutely I agree. Sham has another question. Yes, I think Anish, uh, Ayushi, that's a good idea. Let's everyone switch on their videos. Sham has another question. How do we inject into public consciousness beyond academia the power of using the right language. Oh God, that I, you know, I wish I knew how. Uh, as a teacher, I have very, I've had very limited uh, access and very limited uh, sort of avenues for doing this. But uh, and and you know, why should why should uh, my way of thinking be the only way of thinking? Right. I mean, uh, I think what we what we ought at least to do is for people to 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 make it necessary for people to. Uh, to hold dialogues in, in civilized language, at least, if not, the, I don't know what the right language would be, but at least in civilized language to have civilized discourse rather than the kind of coarse, vulgar, abusive discourse that we are seeing 
particularly on social media today. I, I completely agree with you that uh, you know language is important, but um, uh, but far from you know which one of us can claim that the ideas that we hold and proclaim are the right ones. Uh, we just should be able to argue, disagree, discuss our ideas with other people in in civilized in a civilized way. You know, ten years ago we used to speak about public reasoning. Today, the idea of public reasoning is completely gone out of the window. We can't even talk about it. We don't even talk about it anymore. We just hope for a minimum of civilized discourse, uh, which too is hard to get. Um, Sayantan Chaudhary. Okay. The more marginalized or deprived a group is, the easier it is to coerce them into a consumeristic form of citizenship. Then one based on rights, bad implementation is an obvious culprit, but is there a more insidious intention of keeping implementation bad to polarize these groups further so that a more nationalistic notion of citizenship can be legitimized? Well, I mean, it's a very attractive thesis that you've given, um, but um, I, I don't know, you know, how does one, how does one, uh, and how does one prove intention, insidious or otherwise? One might say that it, it is convenient that because, uh, because um, uh, you know, people are marginalized and deprived, they, they can be more easily made victims of, they are more vulnerable to being used in these ways. But I don't know if one can say that it's the intention uh, to, if, if that is the intention, then we have to say that was the intention for a long, long time, because a lot of these, uh, these forms of deprivation and marginalization have been around for a long, long time. Uh, do we want to say this about uh, about every regime this country has ever had? I don't know. I th I think neglect and um, uh, neglect and and uh, yeah, I guess a lack of uh, of sensitivity in planning, the nature of planning, you know, those sorts of things could have could could be blamed for keeping groups marginalized and deprived. But I th and I think the the, the blame, if we want to call it that, is not just on the state, but also on society. It also falls on society, it falls on us. I mean, social prejudice is something that uh, our educational system should have handled better, but failed to, right? So, um, yeah, so I, I really don't know how, how, how one would prove that there's an insidious intention. Uh, I'd, I'd rather not go there. You, so you agree with me, okay. Uh, Dushant says, I meant not just the need for civilized discourse, but choosing the right words. Yeah, but you know, each of these words, Dushant, I, I completely agree. Empowerment can mean, entitlement can mean good things. There's nothing wrong with entitlement. There's a certain use of entitlement, which is, which is negative and pejorative. But all entitled, when we think about rights and entitlements or thought about them 10 years ago, or 15 years ago, uh, it was not, you know, that I have a sense of entitlement. It was that it is my, I mean, when, when Amartya Sen wrote about famines, right? and about uh, uh, you know, the theory of entitlement in relation to famines, it was about rights. It was not about entitlement in this other sense in which politically we have begun to use it now, right? So um, yeah, so I agree with you. Yes, it means choosing the right word, but also it is up to all of us to you expose the use of words and to, to open up the multiple ways in which words are being used, appropriated, even hijacked sometimes. The usage of a term, I'm, you know, ready. Uh, I mean, empowerment uh, is is one. All of these words have been subject to misuse, to appropriation, to cynical appropriation at times. Especially when it when they're part of sort of political agendas, they tend to be cynically misused. Uh, but it's up to us to expose those multiple uses and to retrieve what we can of the correct usage or what we consider to be uh, the correct usage. Okay, Abdul uh, is asking. What avenues may the victims of economic abatement utilize for self-empowerment? Oh, that's, that's, a, that's a question that you need to tell me more about because you work at the grassroots. Uh, I really don't know uh, how such victims can empower themselves. Uh, I would say that at a minimum, you know, everybody, uh, a strengthened, improved system of public education and public health are the bare minimum before people can be empowered. Uh, you know, to empower themselves, I think they need to be first given 
a robust system of public education and robust systems of public health. Uh, um, without that, I don't think, uh, you know, and basic, uh, basic needs to be met in a little better than basic ways before people can, uh, can even begin to find ways. It's not just self-empowerment. I mean, you know, the um, argument about human capabilities, it's not just human development. We go on to human capabilities and human flourishing and all of those things. Where do people who are poor, who are deprived of an education, deprived of uh, health, deprived of food, deprived of so many things, how do these victims, as you're calling them, um, how do these people actually even think about what the meaning of life is and what, a mean, what the leading of a meaningful life would mean to them? We have the luxury of being able to think about how to lead our lives in a meaningful way, right? Or at least to some extent within constraints that we live within, but uh, the constraints that structure our everyday existence, but within those we do have the luxury of being able to reflect on and to think about what our capabilities may be, what we want, you know, how we want, what kind of a meaningful life we want to lead, what gives meaning to our lives. Most people don't have that. Now, you know, these are people that you work with, so I'm sure you can tell me more about it, like I said, than I can. Um, maybe we could also have some videos on, and uh, if you can raise your hands, the others, if we can have a direct interaction as well. Yeah, I'll switch to gallery view then, so I can see everyone, yeah. Uh, everyone can unmute, right? There's no issue. If there is, you can just raise your hand as well, and then we can enable that. What I can tell most videos are still off, <laughs> then six of us, <laughs> no, seven. <laughs> Um, we have a comment from Dushyant, which says that the unmute option is not yet turned on. Um, Binoy, could we switch that, please? Yeah, I could do it now. Thank you, Binoy. Thanks, Ashwin. Go. So we have a lot of friends uh, from uh, outside our course also. Uh, welcome to pick up. Any uh, doubts, questions? Uh, uh, thanks, Nija. I have a question. I'm sort of still struggling to properly frame it. So uh, please excuse me if it doesn't no come to the in a clear manner. Uh, but I was just struggling with, you know, uh, to understand uh, correlations between you. Now, do you distinguish between development and governance? Uh, but I was also struggling to, you know, uh, understand correlations between development paradigms and governance and how they shape institutions. Uh, for 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 instance, I mean the shift in India has been uh, more so in recent past that uh, the development pathway is privatization and uh, having multinational mega corporates which are you know global sort of icons uh, and and uh, uh, how they do they sort of uh, influence governance and uh, uh, how do you contextualize the citizenry uh, to that? Well, obviously, the um, um, this particular model of development, um, you know, we, we've the term that the label that is often applied to it of crony capitalism. Uh, uh, I don't know what uh, a more neutral phrasing of that in terms of governance discourse might be. Uh, I haven't come across one, and I haven't thought about coining one either uh, myself, but. Uh, uh, but clearly, I mean, its its implications for citizenship are uh, for the practice of citizenship are uh, are are deleterious. They are adverse for the practice of citizenship because the more you have market power, uh, the more that you know, the, the greater uh, the the power of the market uh, in relation, and and the less the protection afforded to the citizen from government. Uh, let alone civil society, but the less the protection afforded by government and the greater uh, the force of market power, uh, the less effective citizenship is likely to be. I mean, that's 
that's my simple, straightforward answer to your question. I, I don't know if you meant something more, uh, if you were asking something that I did not quite comprehend. Is, is, does that answer your question, Ines? Uh, yes, I, I think it definitely does to a certain extent. Uh, I, was, I was also trying to understand how that shift in happen uh, also in values of governance as we perceive it. Uh, or, or our understanding of uh, uh, good governance in the context. Uh, uh, I mean, personally speaking, from a personal uh, opinion, uh, in my peer group, for instance, I have seen a significant shift in what what accounts for uh, good governance today. Well, well, can you tell me a little about that? Because I do, I don't know. Uh, what is your peer group, sorry, and what is the shift? Uh, I mean, peer group is, of course, quite diverse, and uh, uh, I'm not uh, referring to the peer group who is present today, per se. Uh, or let me give you a background. I mean, I, I work on energy and climate governance issues uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the focus on Rajasthan, right? Uh, I have I'm, uh, graduated from IIT Delhi, uh, and uh, sort of that's the sort of a peer group I was referring to, right? right. Uh, yeah. And in terms of whether it's labor reforms of national or global policies, Right, uh, increasingly uh, nationalistic and centralist views uh, have have become prominent. Right, uh, so uh, was uh, trying to understand, you know, how these uh, the shift in development paradigms uh, yeah. uh, uh, undermine uh, democratic values, governance values. Yeah. Uh, to and the I get extent that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I understand what you mean. And I think there has been a diminishing of democratic values. We didn't get a chance today to talk about that. But yes, there is a diminishing of democratic values. Uh, and I think there has been, you know, it's really strange. If you think about it, 20 years ago, uh, people from, I mean, you know, from India, whether they were government or industry or whatever, would go to Davos and, you know, the calling card, India's calling card was democracy. This was what differentiated us from China. So we said, you know, we are both these so-called emerging economies and, you know, we have much more going for us because we are democratic and they are not, right? Uh, so, so there was all this uh, sort of the use of democracy as that which distinguished us from our rivals, from our economic rivals. Today, I think that is more or less gone, despite the lip service that is sometimes paid to democracy and these rhetorical utterances and so on. I think that's gone. I think there is um, and... I think what we have today is an entrenched idea that democracy is only about elections. And so long as elections are held, uh, we are democratic. There is nothing more than, I mean, democracy is supposed to be something that has deep roots in society, in such an unequal, unjust society in which people are routinely made victims of such egregious forms of social injustice, not just oppression but, and exploitation, but also violence. Uh, it is impossible, you know, to think about, not to think about democracy in a more holistic sense, not to think about democracy in terms of something, a principle that informs the relationships between citizens in society. That's also what democracy is supposed to do. It's supposed to influence and impact the ways in which we relate to each other as citizens, as equals. It has not succeeded in doing that. So, uh, this, this very superficial idea that we have of democracy as elections, and elections too can be, uh, can be subverted in multiple ways. I mean, in the 1970s, it was about booth capture. Um, today, you have electoral bonds. You know? There are more efficient ways that have been devised of doing the same thing, uh, if you like. Those were more rustic and primitive ways of doing the things that are done today in more sophisticated ways. So uh, yes, the, I think the idea of democracy has been diminished, has been impoverished actually. I'd say it has been substantively impoverished today. And, and those values simply have no meaning for people because what those values suggest goes against the other values that have been put in their place, exactly what you said, I, I wouldn't call it nationalism, I would call it jingoism. There's only jingoism, there's no nationalism. You and I are as nationalist as the next person, right? And uh, yeah, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks. I think here, ma'am, um, uh, more than a question, I think just a personal yeah. sharing uh, since mm -hmm. I've been in the last couples, uh, in the Northeast. Yeah. So a lot of times uh, when we were in the remote areas, uh, a lot of our produce or market, or you know, if I have to go as a personal level, buy vegetables, mm -hmm. I would go to the border heart. So mm -hmm. I, 
sometimes felt I was more uh, attuned with Bangladesh than I was with India. So then when you again go to the... In village, what way? In what way? In what specific way? Uh, because anything that I needed, uh, I was only getting it through the border hard. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, available in my own uh, radius of a couple of kilometers or it had to be going to the next state, neighboring state. Mm -hmm. So uh, it always made me wonder that, you know, again, but still all of us, we say we are citizens of this country and I would keep telling myself, am I really a citizen of India or should I have my affiliation to Bangladesh? So, um, so I mean, this is again, it's still a pondering for me that, you know, what is it that binds the Northeast? I mean, I'm still an outsider in the Northeast and I'm feeling this way. Uh, but when I would casually talk and all, and everyone has this feeling that, yes, we are a part of India, but still, uh, so all these concepts of uh, then when you say about social citizenship, about how uh, everything, I mean, it is a right for me to get my produce or it is a right for me to get things available in the market where I am living and it's not available, but I'm getting it through. Uh, yeah, but you know, uh, sorry, Hima, that's very interesting what you said, but the, um, uh, the, the idea that I should be able to buy whatever I need uh, may or may, may not really be encompassed by the area of social citizenship. Social citizenship is really about uh, provisioning by the state uh, for the citizen, less about market. Markets are you know, determined by slightly different logics. But, uh, but, but the Northeast and the, um, uh, the marginalization, if you like, of the Northeast and of Northeastern society in general is, uh, is, is definitely a, a cause for concern. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of good writing on this now, uh, increasingly. Um, uh, a young person who's a young anthropologist who's just written a book that I'm about to start reading in fact now, um, has written a book on... Um, uh, you know, the uh, Baptist missionaries in Nagaland. I can't remember the title right now. The author is called Kanato Chofi, C-H-O-P-H-Y. And he has, you know, put forward the idea of constitutional Indians. Now, that is a, a very interesting phrase because he's talking about Indians, uh, you know, not in terms of ethnic identities, but talking in terms of the project of making constitutional Indians. And uh, so, I'm, as I said, I'm just about, I just got this book and I'm looking forward to reading it. But, uh, but yes, I mean, marginality in the North, there, is, there are so many types of marginality in our society. They are regional, they are religious, they are linguistic. There are so many different types of marginality. Uh, uh, and, you know, this is one of the important ones, absolutely. And so thank you for sharing that, uh, uh, you know, that moment that you felt in the border hearts. Uh, yeah, I mean... So Dushant has asked another question. Um, how do we go about expanding the idea? Great, ma'am. Probably maybe somebody else has a question. Oh, somebody else is it? somebody else is you. Okay, well, somebody's asked this question. It comes as Dushant. How do we go? No, about it's me only. I mean, I you? don't want to hog your time space. <laughs> no, no, not at all. In case there is, yeah. <laughs> how do we go about expanding the idea of participation in the citizen's mind beyond election? What are the other such tangible forms of the idea of participation? Well, I mean, you know, participation starts at home. Really speaking, I mean, uh, it should start in the home, literally, uh, because, you know, governance is something which goes all the way from the family to, uh, uh, to the UN. So uh, in that sense, but, uh, but the idea of participation, at least in, in social life, is something we can foster, really only begin to foster at the local level. And that's easier done in smaller spaces than in larger uh, spaces like Delhi, which really doesn't have civic spaces. Uh, you know, I'm probably Mumbai doesn't too. I don't know where else all of you are, but uh, uh, but yes, I mean, the, the idea of participation, even if we could, I mean, I think the thing, the first question to ask is if you're living anywhere near a Gram Sabha, I am not, but I've been to many. If you're living anywhere near a Gram Sabha, what is the nature of participation there? I remember a Gram Sabha in a pretty well-off village in uh, somewhere near Mysore. I don't remember the name of the place now. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, and the person, uh, I mean, the, the house in which this Gram Sabha was being held in the veranda of this house and then the garden, uh, whatever, the open area in front, uh, there was a house right beside it, not even three meters from or two meters from this other house where the Gram Sabha was being held. And there was a, a woman standing there. And I said, you know, you're not attending the Gram Sabha many years ago. And she said, no, uh, nothing for me there. It's only for BPL and for people who don't have house Indira Avas, Yojana, whatever it was then. I'm there's not, there's nothing for me. I don't get anything. So why should I go? She's standing right there. She can see and hear what's going on outside her wall. 
outside her door, but she was not attending the Gram Sabha, so she's not listed as, you know, by the secret by the Panchayat Secretary as one of the people who's there, uh, because she sees no value. So we have to start by, in, in a sense, that's where we need to start. Why is participation important? What is, uh, you know, what does participation do? Why, why should we participate, right? That was very well said, ma'am. Participation begins at home. And I think over the <laughs> yes. one thing that even personally I have realized how democratic I am with my own kids. Good, <laughs> good. Yeah, that's right. And that's the way to be. It has to start. It has to start at home. Yeah. I mean, if, if your kids are participating with you in decisions that you are taking for them, uh, you know, that's where it starts. Yeah. And of course, there are much bigger questions. Uh, women have, much young women have many more uh, difficult uh, situations to face in homes. So, uh, you know, layers of patriarchy and, you know, permissions and what you can do and what you cannot do and, and all of those things. So, yeah, so governance starts from the home, actually. Mm. Simran, would you like to go? Uh, I see yeah. a... I have another specific question. Yes. Uh, since you, since you described social, social citizenship as uh, largely dealing with the provisions by the government. Uh, if we look at it in the context of climate change, right, uh, where I think uh, the vulnerabilities of social groups, communities uh, uh, are, uh, are not just, uh, 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 you know, diverse uh, and, uh, 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 but, or let me say they are not just diverse uh, uh, regionally, but also, of course, it affects people, uh, different groups, social groups uh, differently, right? Uh, people in different livelihoods uh, yeah. uh, differently. Uh, so how can uh, how can possibly governance uh, 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 respond to the needs of uh, these diverse needs uh, in two terms? One is of course the adaptation uh, requirements uh, uh, or adaptation needs and urgencies, uh, but also on on a, on a sort of a global uh, global level uh, or global political dis discourse uh, uh, representative uh, action that is needed. Yeah, this is really, you know, something obviously that I am no, I have no expertise in on. I know that, you know, climate adaptation strategies, um, uh, there's, uh, there's a global hierarchy, first of all, what was that common, but on, what was that uh, phrase used in the earlier iterations of uh, climate change summits? You know, that the uh, responsibilities uh, that devolve on developing countries have to be less than those that devolve on the greater polluters in the global right. north, there was that phrase, common and common but differentiated responsibility. That's the one, yeah? So, I mean, I think some variation of that same principle presumably needs to apply uh, when you look at differentiations within populations. I mean, uh, uh, you know, there are areas where you don't even have smokeless chulas. Uh, there are people who are dependent upon all kinds of, uh, uh, all kinds of resources for, to meet their basic energy needs. So how are we going to treat that? Uh, obviously, we can't expect uh, uh, poor people uh, dependent upon um, those kinds of things to be, uh, to be able to adapt to uh, strategies of the kinds that are handed down from above. I, but I, but you know, I, like I said, this is, you know, this is way beyond my ken. This is really your, your field, but I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to go along with whatever you think. And I, I mean, I'd like to hear what you think and then decide whether it makes sense to me or not. <laughs> Why don't you tell me? Since you're the expert in the field. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not the expert. We just start <laughs> ventured into yeah. it, just trying to make sense. Yeah, of I'm, I'm just trying to see whether, uh, whether the common principle also apply yeah. within, within domestic populations, not just at the international level. That's all, simple. Uh, what I mean, uh, to, I mean, one thing that we definitely identified it's it's not just social and uh, social and economic rights, but it's also very closely linked to environmental and cultural rights. Correct, correct, correct. 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 Yeah, I wish we had the policy sensitivity to take all those all those considerations into account while formulating policy. Uh, I'm not sure that we do. Ideally, yes, we should. I would also invite other participants, uh, not necessarily questions, but also from the talk, any uh, reflections or any, uh, whatever you're feeling, you want to just share a uh, short, I mean, not if, if it's possible, if your bandwidth allows. And questions are always welcome, definitely. But I was just also thinking that this could be a forum. We still have a couple of minutes uh, for you to just share your experience as well.
Okay. Certainly, yes. So we have a lot of newcomers as well yes, to our today. There are two more questions, Ali. Should I take these? Yes, please, ma'am. Okay, so Anisha Chaudhary is asking, could I name a few books authors to read to understand contemporary citizenship better? May I send these to Hema because it's a longish list. I'll make a list and send it to Hema. And you can share it with? Yes, Anisha? I'll okay. the details and I'll share it. Okay, with. okay. Um, because if I start typing them in now, uh, you know, we will, we will not have much time. Uh, Santan again is asking aspects of good governance, like transparency or inclusion are often used to legitimate corporatization of social services. How can one go beyond the rhetorics and rhetoric and show that corporatization also goes against other aspects of good governance? Ma'am, before you answer, uh, yeah. for the benefit of our uh, Facebook audience, uh, should one of us read out the question uh, distinctly? Okay, why don't you do that? Yeah, uh, Because okay. they can't see that. Yeah, yeah go ahead. So, Sainthan is asking, uh, aspects of good governance like transparency or inclusion are often used to legitimate corporatization of social services. So, how can one go beyond the rhetorics and show that corporatization also goes against other aspects of good governance? Can you recommend any framework to analyze these development reforms more critically? And uh, he has put some brackets to lead you in that yeah. direction. Well, I mean, you know, I think the basic, uh, it's a one word answer really, which is accountability. Uh, when, when, you're co when you have corporatized social services, you don't have accountability. When you have government social services, uh, you may not still get accountability, but you can at least ask for accountability. So uh, the relationship that you bear to the provision of those services, and I said this when, in my talk, is a, relationship, uh, is, is a relationship of rights. You have a right to those services. The minute you become a consumer of those services, you no longer have the right, you no, and you no longer have accountability. You can no longer exact accountability because you, the rights claim is addressed to the state and the accountability claim to no one. There's no one there to respond to the accountability claim. So I, I think that is the sense in which, but the other way to, you're saying how to show, how to show it is really only to show, to compare, maybe do a piece of research in comparing similar sectors or, or in the same sector if possible, between um, people, uh, between the social services provided by the state and social services provided uh, in this other corporatized way that you're talking about. If you can compare the outcomes of these services and also get the perceptions of people who have actually uh, received those services, benefited from those services uh, as, as citizens, as opposed to users or consumers, uh, you know, you might be able to, uh, I, I don't know what that kind of research design might be because you might find it hard to get um, initiatives in the same sector, which are state and uh, non-state, but, uh, but it might be worth thinking about that. To prove the point, as, as I think the question is partly asking, you would need to be able to, to compare this through research. Uh, but uh, conceptually, the difference is that of accountability. Abdul is again asking about distinguishing misinformation with truth. Well, I mean, uh, you know, this is, the whole world is asking this question right now. Uh, Ranu, I'm a veteran of, what am I a veteran of? I don't know. Uh, could you share, we ever practice an ideal democracy? No, of course not. There's no such thing as an ideal democracy. Democracy is always a work in progress. It, there is no such thing as an ideal democracy. You can have ideals that you wish to cultivate in your, democ in your democratic practice, but uh, an ideal democracy, as far as I know, has never existed in the world and probably cannot. It is always a work in progress. It's something you have to strive towards. Um, I, I have a question that I'll try to, I'll attempt to frame, um, and this is from your uh, most recent book. Um, and you, you speak, you've spoken about how this, if the standard assumption that citizenship entails rights is implicitly if it's repudiated. And while at the same time, we, we're finding that moral duties are being hyped as imperative, right? And we've seen that in demonetization, you noted it about how uh, people would bear unimaginable struggles for the nations, and that has been cultivated more, more and more. Um, and therefore, citizens are being held more accountable. Uh, so this 
imbalance uh, isn't it uh, harder now for it is harder now for citizens maybe to hold states accountable through mobilization i i understand even as we have achieved it on some level today but it has been it has borne great cost it's that the the farm protests have been more than 600 plus deaths um but where is the bureaucracy in the middle of all this where is the resistance from the bureaucracy is it present uh, they are also citizens uh, where is that or what is the barrier that is preventing that well i mean your guess is as good as mine as to whether it's present or not present but uh, um yeah i mean for the most part we don't hear the bureaucracy speaking up on these issues we do hear former bureaucracy bureaucrats speaking up the the constitutional conduct group certainly uh, speaks up and you know writes long uh, letters on important issues of the moment uh, addresses them to the government but uh, but you know you for every speaker you need a listener right and uh, that is the problem i think ultimately there is no substitute for citizen awareness and citizen awareness has to be reflected in the polling booth uh, you can have the polling booth without citizen awareness and it's not much good and you have citizen awareness without the polling booth that's not much good either you need both of those things citizen awareness mobilization by civil society perhaps and you know political parties are supposed to do this but political parties have also failed to do this in in you know most political parties have failed miserably in doing this in building counter narratives and and, and so on so only when you have citizen awareness however it comes whether through the ages of political parties or through uh, or through uh, civil society or through people's own uh, you know access to information uh, through whatever sources of information they have access to it's only that kind of informed information and understanding and that kind of awareness that when uh, uh, when effectuated or given effect through the ballot box can make a difference yeah right thank you thank our you. our poster has the polling booth on it yes i so saw I that about okay. how to incorporate citizenship awareness into it yeah yeah <laughs> good one i wish you luck with that yeah right so are we done then hema um, just a few more we'll just give there are okay Uh, another thing um, as again uh, yeah. another uh, question on behalf of the group also as students yeah. of governance uh, we just wanted your thoughts on um, there is uh, in the recent years a distinction is being made for the indian form of governance versus the western notion of what governance is and that has come about in your writings as well so um, is there actually any distinction or uh, what would your thoughts be on i actually have no idea what an indian form of governance is honestly i mean i don't think i've written about it you said it come in my writings but i i have never mentioned the no, indian no, form of no, governance no. i don't no. think there is any such thing i mean we we have a, a constitution which is you know three quarters of it borrowed from the government of india act 1935 as we all know very well uh, so you know we function within the framework of a westminster model of parliamentary democracy uh, we have uh, a civil service which also functions supposedly along those same principles though as sham rightly pointed out um, you know not necessarily always so really speaking i don't know what an indian model of governance might be uh, uh, certainly i don't know of any local or or indigenous let's say indigenous model of governance you know it's possible that in the fifth and sixth schedule areas you have indigenous models of governance that uh, uh but but you know those are really meant for areas which are much more demarcated they are not meant for nation states and if you look at nation states uh, and the scale of governance in a nation state uh, it's hard to think of any indigenous model that would not be monarchical or im- or imperial on its scale i mean those have been the forms of ruling that the subcontinent has seen imperial states monarchical states kingdoms that's the form of indigenous government that we have seen for the most part other than the areas as i mentioned where adivasi areas and others which you know it's on a smaller scale, more limited scale so i really don't know what an indian model of governance is i uh, i'm not even sure i want to hear about it, to be honest i think if we could just you know do a better job of 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 the constitution that we have uh, i would be perfectly happy with that So 
any last, uh, just a few, uh, any reflections or any other questions from anyone in the larger audience so who's listening in today? Uh, Shyam, do we have any questions on the uh, Facebook chat or anything? We are not missing out on anything, right? Yeah. Uh, let me let me just check. Thank you, Hema. Give me a moment. Yeah, I think we have. Uh, we also have uh, Suresh sir with us. So if you are, I don't know, Chennai is having a lot of rains today. So yes, not... I know for the last week, in fact, more than a week now. Okay. Hi, hi, Suresh, how are you? Hi, Nirza. Yeah, and it, it was a wonderful, wonderful lecture coming at a time when we uh, are hearing that uh, there are these human rights wallas who always talk about rights and don't talk about duties. Yes. And that uh, there is an Indian notion of uh, human rights, uh, which also includes an Indian notion of development. Yeah. And, uh, that is what we should be talking about. And those are the danger signals that that are abounding. And I wish some of what you talked about could also resound in those halls. <laughs> <laughs> Most unlikely and just as well not. <laughs> <laughs> our, separate, uh, our two separate worlds are fine. <laughs> It was a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Suresh. Pleasure to meet you and look forward to meeting up properly sometime. Thank you so much. Uh, in fact, we have had a fair amount of discussion on, from the origin of good governance coming up from the World Bank, uh, yeah. from the whole political economy of governance and how much it has shaped this whole notion of governance, how it's being pushed forward. And the current stage now, in there, your book, Reforming Governance, uh, uh, Reforming, in yeah. the history of great use. Thank you. It's one of the major readings that we have. So thank you so much. Thank so you. Nice so to have you there for share with I had great contributors, great essayists in that book. Yes. Really, people, uh, people with great expertise in their own fields. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that we did cover and which we have not been able to get much uh, uh, information about was this uh, 2004 PIL that you said had been filed. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know that E.S. Sarma had was he also. Was one, Mother Godbully and E.S. Sarma had filed this. Yeah, yeah. 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 It didn't go very far. It, yeah, if you find, like, it, you find it on the, you can Google it, you'll find it. It's written about. Yeah, no, we have, we have two readings on that. We have actually three readings. Right. I saw Godbully is in your reading list. I saw that. Yeah. Godbully and then you have the other two. Uh, one which talks about Godbully, the other one which is sort of uh, raises issues about Godbully. So we thought that students should get uh, focus I mean, it should get uh, to know a variety of views on the same thing. So, yeah, we'll... yeah, right. No, you're right. If you ever come across this PIL, if you come across it, please let me know because you're in the profession. If you ever yes. find it, I'd love to read it, uh, uh, you know, the, the entire text of it. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, I just I just uh, was talking to E.A. Sarma yesterday. I see. And I didn't know that he was one of the petitioners. So, well, I will actually, definitely... why don't you ask him for it then? No, I'll definitely ask him. I yeah, know him. I'd, yeah. And do share it with me as well. I'd love to read it. I will definitely, I'll definitely share it. With you. I mean, you know, I think that the phrase was, uh, the, the, the label good governance was probably a bit of a, uh, you know, uh, maybe not the best label to use, but I think the intent was clearly excellent, but it's just the... Correct, correct. It was a good idea at a very different time, so... That's right. And, and, the, word, and the words used were perhaps yes. not most appropriate. I mean, they were, they're hard to pin down, you know. Correct. Good for whom? Good in whose view? Right. And that's the politics behind it. So That's the politics behind it. Correct. Yeah. No, I, I knew that the world you were doing the World Bank uh, discourse as well as critical articles on that, that Hema had shared with me. But I thought that you, you know, that the group may not have been exposed to the more recent rethinking uh, and the revisiting of this. Uh, so that's why I brought up Merrily Grindle's work as one example of that. Yes, yes, yes. I wasn't sure that whether the group had actually been no, we have not. We have not probably we added those. Yeah, no, those are those are worth looking at because they actually sort of you know explode the idea from internally from somebody who would have supported the idea originally and then begins to uh, you know change her mind about uh, about this idea as she sees it being implemented and you know becoming donor policy in multiple countries. Uh, so and the, and the course and also my own personal work about forty years now in the field, both at policy and 
with grassroots, as you were talking about, has been how do you look at governance in terms of strengthening and deepening democracy? Yeah. At the end of the day, it's, it's about equity and... That's uh, right. I mean, if, not, if none of those values are there, that's, that, that, that's not governance. Absolutely, that's not governance, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I hope to have more discussions with you at a later time. Hope so. Hope because so. Our work has been on governance with multiple levels. So you told time. me, and I saw the brochure as well that Hema had forwarded. Last 25 years. So it's something I would like to, to contact you. And uh, please look forward to that. Look forward to that. And a request and an invitation to all the other uh, participants who are not the participants of in touch with us. The idea is not that. Uh, of course, the idea is that how do we as citizens come together because we are going through a very difficult patch in our country's history and we need to all join hands together to safeguard the little bit of space that is still left, which might go off very soon. And the farmers protest has shown that it's possible to, to be able to challenge and yet win the day. Yeah, and but that also we must remember, uh, you know, the electoral uh, yes. calculations that matter. Yeah. And so it's important to keep those also uh, kind of, uh, you know, to remember that that dimension also needs to be cultivated and worked on. The Correct. electoral political process is yes. also an area where there needs to be, uh, you know, no, no, the, no, no, no. the polling booth that uh, Shyam was talking about. Yeah, and ultimately it's those polling booths which uh, bring about these type of changes. Correct. Whether it was the on the COVID vaccination uh, less than a year back, or about the farm laws now, it's much less to do with equity and more yeah. to do with winning, winning votes. And that's the danger. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, it's an open, it's an opportunity. Obviously. It's a danger, but it's also an opportunity. Correct. Yeah. So up to us to be able to grab it. So. Yeah, that, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. I think we'll just have a quick uh, Dushyant, if you could just uh, we invite you to. Yeah, thank you, Emma. Uh, so, uh, quick summarization. Just in uh, so we had covered a broad range of topics. Uh, we started with this uh, question of uh, what does citizens have to do with democracy, and then we structured the whole talk on uh, two halves. Uh, Nizam, Professor Nizam, uh, introduced the certain concepts citizens in the beginning, and then we went, moved on to the second part of the conversation where we talked about social citizenship. Uh, from the perspective of the governed, uh, which is the uh, rarely touched upon in the academic uh, books. So some of the, uh, I think, uh, where variety of concepts were presented. Some of them were about the difference between, uh, in the initial discourse in the 1940s, uh, between the words governance and uh, government, uh, that hair split, uh, and how, uh, you know, uh, it went on to influence uh, or had impact on uh, how governance uh, later on became into a donor-driven uh, discourse. So during the 70s and all, uh, that was one of the uh, you know, uh, shape how governance took. And uh, then we went on to move, um, uh, went on to explain how the pluralization of uh, power happens between the state, market, and uh, uh, and the civil society. And uh, so the... Uh, and also, she went on to demonstrate how none of these elements, you know, either state or citizenship, or, or sorry, state or market or civil society, leave any room for actual citizens to participate, uh, beautifully demonstrated. And uh, at the same time, uh, we went uh, from there, we've developed onto the uh, part where uh, certain examples. So also, uh, we, we touched upon how uh, it is difficult for the citizen to participate in any of this, given the, our context of local government and all. Uh, from there, we moved on to the concept of uh, social citizenship, uh, where the second half, where we talked about, uh, you know, initially we started with the historical perspective, how social and economic rights were way, way uh, you know, were well known to Indians way, way back in the 1920s. Still, they took a back step because of uh, how ma'am mentions as ideological ambivalence and uh, political compromises. So it was all very diluted, uh, the efforts were not. And uh, actually, even before that, we started with this uh, definition of where does this concept of uh, social citizenship come? Because citizenship in itself initially was, uh, you know, 
it kind of uh, it, it went off into a contradiction on one side it was uh, intended to uh, reduce inequality but at the same time it was being used as an excuse the presence of citizenship was being used as a excuse for continuing of inequality so to or uh, knew that contradiction uh, new and newer ideas of social citizenship uh, which mainly dealt with government provisioning uh, of the citizen uh, came in and uh, how uh, you know uh, she went on to describe how civil civil and uh, political rights are not much different from social and economic rights initially uh, there is a you know uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, political theories where said on citizenship has to be dealing with civil and political rights and uh, they are anyway easier to give because they are negative rights whereas uh, social and economic rights are harder to for the state to give because they are costly and and, uh, and she to, she quoted on uh, that how the academy are developed for the stating that every every right has be negative rights or positive rights they do have a cost so it is better that we can you know we do not uh, uh, deposition the social and economic rights of citizens and uh, all these rights and then we went on to a beautiful hair split between the, uh, you know even in the right what do we call this right do we call them as empowerment or do we call them as entitlement usually because the word uh, empowerment kind of uh, shows that uh, you know uh, kind of puts the, the end user as a you know consum consumer and somebody who needs to be lifted up some basically somebody who is a receiver of handouts uh, whereas entitlement talks about our initial you know uh, our the basic idea of political theory that uh, you know our democracy there are certain inalienable rights that were born with so we are entitled to this but somehow in practice it has come into the place where uh, you know rights are just given up and uh, she demonstrated how this is happening in terms of uh, how this is de delicately subtly happening because of the categorization in the name of giving uh, welfare we have bracketed people into smaller uh, groups and then started giving welfare only to those groups instead of giving them across all citizenship so that uh, was one is one of the prime questions ma'am raised do we need to do this do we need to continue this uh, classification what are the pros and cons of such a classification and uh, gradually uh, the, uh, the talk developed and uh, she presented case studies uh, over through which we have proved that or may come um, to conclusion that social security as, as such is uh, given to those who can afford and not those and not to those who and uh, to those who actually really need it it has just become a hogwash so we uh, in the meanwhile she and uh, we she used a brilliant concept of uh, power uh, productivist productivist welfare capitalism in proving this so productivist welfare capitalism is the where all the welfare given to the citizens as an input so that citizens uh, you know flow back the into the industrial machinery in the machinery so citizens are seen as a user, users rather than Uh, equal participants, and uh, so. Uh, Thank you so much. Dushan. This particular, yeah, that that's how uh, we come to this conclusion, Hema, uh, that uh, it might lead to divisions in society, uh, like the forming formation of second class divisions. Thank you. Sorry for <laughs> repeating too many things. Uh, Nijam, uh, excuse me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Just a heartfelt thanks again for everyone thank present you. here, for you especially, ma'am. Thank you for the invitation. It was a pleasure to to meet with all of you. Meet in a certain sense. Yeah. And main reason for Suresh sir for actually enabling us and for getting all of this together also, so that then we start uh, this through our course itself. So it's been very enlightening. Uh, we want to take it forward, and we will definitely read up on a lot more that you have uh, told us about. And it's very exciting also to uh, at least I think I'm still stuck with that good enough governance. So. <laughs> Next discussion is. Going we'll get to, to governance RIP very soon. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks very much. Goodbye. Good night. Good night. So, friends, uh, uh, we have a lot of. Uh,
new faces. Uh, welcome to stay back and ask any questions you have regarding our course, what we do, what we learn. How did you come to know about us? Suresh, sir, you're on mute. Sir, you're on mute. Would any of the newcomers like to introduce themselves? And how did you like the talk? Some uh, Stella Marie students also we've seen very interesting to hear a little from you, if your bandwidth allows. <laughs> 